In short, the projections for this quarter do not reflect the growth predicted or hoped for. Adding in the issues with the supply chain due to Defiance's announcement, How can they do that? We've got contracts signed to prevent this very situation. They see the hell as a competitor. It's only logical they would want to find a way out. How are we competing? The hell is sold to what? A few Merc units and some Free Worlds League basket cases that want to pay in scrap metal? This is crazy. The fact is, with the situation on the ground as it is, we cannot continue production with the parts we have on hand. As the head of the board, I must call for a vote to seek a new path forward. Nobody's buying battle mechs right now. This whole venture was reckless. The inner sphere shifted. Who could have predicted fewer wars after what the Blakists were doing? I suppose we course correct and return to what made this company a success. We should seek a buyer for the Hell program, designs, and wash our hands of it. Our future will be secured through the return to the bedrock of this company's values. We must refocus on our core profit-generating areas. I second the motion and call for a vote. Let Defiance and the wannabes squabble over the scraps while we profit. As much fun as the grand battles between battle mechs can be, it can be argued that the nastiest and most underhanded of fights in the Inner Sphere were carried out in corporate boardrooms and backroom deals with government bureaucrats. Wars fought and won not with lasers and PPC fire, but with control over resources and logistics trains. The story of the Eris can only be properly told if we understand the history of the Hell, a battle mech created years before. Nashan Diversified is a corporation with a pedigree that dates back to the First Succession War when it focused on producing just computers. Production lines and their mission expanded over the years, and Nashan ended up making everything from consumer goods to vehicles to industrial machinery spread across more than a half dozen planets within the Lyran Commonwealth. By the late 3060s, Nashan held dominating market share across Lyran controlled space in most sectors except the production of battle mechs. With fingers in so many pies and even dabbling in politics, it was only a matter of time before Nashan Diversified saw potential in creating their own battle mech design. After all, they had made large amounts of money producing the parts often used within mechs and other military equipment for years. It only made sense that they would complete that last step and claim the sizable chunk of market share from other companies like Defiance Industries. During development, business was booming and there was high demand for battle mechs during the tumultuous Word of Blake years. Though Nashan did see some significant losses due to the widespread conflict, overall it endured better than most and the company saw great potential in their emerging battle mech design. By 3092, the battle mech christened the HL-1 Hell was ready for full-scale production. Weighing in at 50 tons, the Hell was envisioned as a heavy-hitting medium that could take advantage of its XL engine to keep up with its peers. Nashan spared little expense in its use of N&D HLBM endosteel and a Hermes 250XL fusion engine. Saving valuable tonnage for weaponry, the 6.5-ton 250XL engine allowed the Hell to run at a top speed of 86 km per hour, and the addition of the Hildco Model 13 jump jets further improved agility by allowing the Hell to leap over 150 meters. The 10 tons of in-house produced Nashan HD standard armor offered fair protection at the same level as comparable designs such as the Enforcer 3 and Huron Warrior, and slightly better than the Night Sky and the Bushwhacker. Packed with 14 double heat sinks, the Hell would need all of them for its energy-heavy loadout. Lacking a ready supply of their own weaponry, Nashan had to resort to purchasing two of Hell's four weapons from Defiance Industries in order to complete the mech as designed. The build was dominated by the installation of a Defiance 980 heavy particle projection cannon in the mech's right arm. Weighing 10 tons and able to cause the equivalent damage of a Gauss rifle slug against its target, the Hell was intended to quickly end fights with other mechs with a couple of well-aimed shots. Backing up the heavy PPC in the left torso was a Defiance Sting 3 Streak SRM-6 launcher, along with one ton of ammunition protected by Case 2. Finally, a pair of Blaze Fire long shot ER medium lasers in the left arm completed the build. While the Alpha Strike damage is only 29, the ability to place 15 of it into a single location made going up against the Hell a dangerous gamble. With only going up to plus one on the heat scale afterward, the Hell's target can't expect any reprieve unless heat is being added from an external source or if the Hell is jumping. While Nashan envisioned the Hell as the worthy competitor to other medium mechs like the Wolverine and Enfield, 
their optimistic market projections were undermined by the shifting economic reality of the post-Blakist universe. The hell simply wasn't ready in time, and when Nashan approached the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces for a contract, they were rebuffed. Not willing to give up, they sought purchases outside of the Commonwealth. The Hell did see some success among the small fiefdoms and provincial governments of the former Free Worlds League, and several mercenary units were eager to buy up the new energy-focused mech at a discount. Unfortunately, these sales were just not enough to justify the ongoing costs of production. By 3110, Defiance Industries sent notice that they were no longer going to supply the heavy PPC and streak SRM-6 to Nashan. And that was the final nail in the coffin. Production stopped while the company sought to recover what they could from their investment by selling the rights to produce the hell to another manufacturer. While it seemed that few were interested in yet another 50-ton battle mech, the hell did perform well in the field. The most notable example was during the Wolf's Dragoons raid into the Duchy of Tamarind Abbey in 3094. A dropship filled with elements from the Dragoons Black Cats Battalion was forced to divert from a planned LZ and ended up a hundred kilometers away from the main force. Seeking repair parts for the dropship, three Hells were tasked with defending the LZ from attack. After spotting an approaching column including tanks, infantry, and a lance of battle mechs, the three Hells set up an ambush along an expected route. Enchanted by the opportunity to capture an almost undefended dropship, the duchy forces rushed forward only to be pummeled by the Hells after they stepped from cover. The well-aimed heavy PPC shots shredded the back armor of the column's battle mechs. Missiles and laser fire lanced the column before the Hells leapt from the chaos they had caused. The duchy column was delayed and ultimately unable to push forward, which allowed the dropship repairs to continue and ultimately escape. Now you might be asking at this point, Mechfrog, if you love the Hell so much, why don't you change the video thumbnail? Well, we're getting there. We have to Hell before we can Eris. Ultimately, Nishan was able to find a buyer for the Hell, and their official production ceased. It's one of those times where the mech's run came to an end not because of any glaring flaw, but because it just couldn't find a foothold in a crowded marketplace at a time when state actors and mercenary companies were purchasing fewer battle mechs. To one place Eris drew them in, the fearful battle queen, beheld of none but cloaked in clouds, blood raining. On she stalked, swelling the mighty roar of battle, now rushed through Troy's squadrons, now Phobos and Deimos still waited on her steps to make their father's sister glorious. From small to large, that fury's stature grew. Her arms of adamant were blood besprent. The deadly lance she brandished reached the sky. Earth quaked beneath her feet. Dread blasts of fire flamed from her mouth. Her voice pealed thunder-like, kindling strong men. Swift closed the fronts of fight drawn by a dread power to do the mighty work. Thankfully, the story of the Hell didn't technically end as the design was picked up by Callan Weapon Industries, who sought to refit the mech and rebrand it as the ERS-2N Anris, named after the ancient Greek goddess of discord and strife. It was a bold name for a mech intended to make a tremendous impact on the battlefields of the post-Blake states of the defunct Free Worlds League. With production lines on loyalty, a planet deep within FWL space, only minor changes were made to the mech's original frame, barring one notable exception, often only to swap out parts for what Callan produced or what could be produced locally by other distributors. That notable exception was the installation of the Chilton 360 jump jets and a partial wing, new technology borrowed from the Jade Falcons who had demonstrated its effectiveness. The partial wing added an additional 60 meters to the leaping distance and helped keep the mech cool in standard atmosphere. Plus, it added a flair to the already sleek design. After all, we know a vehicle travels faster once you put a spoiler on the back. The 587 movement for the Eris is definitely one of the main draws, as speed is life when you're rocking an Inner Sphere XL engine. The weapons loadout for the Eris relied upon the mech's mobility to get in close for an accurate kill shot. The Fusagon Smarttooth snub nosed particle projection cannon in the mech's right arm is going to be the primary damage dealer, though it is backed up by the flexible dual Holly 5 tube multi missile launchers. Finally, a trio of diverse optics small X pulse lasers are useful for scoring out the insides of mechs once you've punched through their armor and for clearing out trenches of those oh so flammable infantry. The damage profile for the Eris can depend upon the range and ammo loadout for the two MML 5 launchers. 
The most common configuration splits the two tons of ammunition between LRMs and SRMs in order to be useful at all ranges. At long range, the equivalent of an LRM-10 isn't that impressive, but the Aris can contribute, at least with its indirect fire, on the way to work. Starting at 15 hexes, the snub-nosed PPC comes into play and will start doing increasing amounts of damage as you move closer. From 5 to 8 to 10 at 9 hexes. At that 9 hexes, the possible alpha strike goes up to 10 for the PPC and 20 for the two flights of 5 SRMs. Then starting at 5 hexes, another 9 points of damage can be added for the three small X pulse lasers. As far as heat generation goes on the 2N, you're going to have to be savvy, especially if you're leaping on those jump jets between shots. Having just 10 double heat sinks can leave you feeling a bit warm in your cockpit once you start firing those small X pulse lasers. It's not easy mode, but definitely not a hotbox thanks to the partial wings additional 3 cooling with each jump. Where the hell failed to find traction in a crowded market, at a time when few were interested in investing in new battle mechs, the Eris was released to a hungry market. With the Free Worlds League shattered into fragments of squabbling microstates in 3079 following the destruction of the Word of Blake, everyone wanted a speedy mech that could operate well in a wide variety of environmental conditions, terrain, and with inconsistent supply chains. When deployed, battle reports were very favorable from both battlefield commanders and the mech warriors themselves who appreciated the flexibility of the mech and ability to apply damage where it was needed, when it was needed. The mech's success drove additional sales and the Eris has become, in the time since, a frequent sight among the various Free Worlds League militaries. Now as much fun as the original Eris 2N is, we have been graced with a couple of variants that offer very unique ways to run the mech. Following Clan Wolf's rampage across the Free Worlds League planets, including Thermopylae, the Hell was rediscovered and it prompted demands that Kallen bring back the design. They acquiesced, and the ERS-2H was produced, which was identical in loadout and construction except for the swapped local producers instead of Defiance Industries tech. We won't go through all the details a second time, but as a Jade Falcon fan, I can empathize with the desire to fire a heavy PPC at Clan Wolf battle mechs. The Aris 3R variant is our most recent refit, first produced in 3130 and taking a much, much different route to the application of force. This Operation Sneaky Sneak variant includes an Angel ECM system in the left arm, along with a tag in the center torso, to allow the Aris to be an agile artillery spotter. Two ER medium lasers in the left arm and one in the head provide decent damage potential out to the mid-range. The stars of the show, however, are the 24 Rocket Launcher 10s packed into every nook and cranny on the Aris's structure. Extra spaces were even needed to make this happen, so the endosteel frame was swapped out for a composite internal structure. Now doing the math, that's 240 rockets that could theoretically be fired. Now I say theoretically because 24 rocket launchers, all fired at the same time, would generate 72 heat, which is enough to shut the mech down almost twice over. So in-universe, unless the mech warrior intended to intimidate his or her enemies by exploding in front of them like Hogan at a pie-eating contest, I would use those rocket launchers sparingly. Much more realistically, the Eris 3R mech warrior should wait until the opportune moment to fire a good number of the rocket launchers at a time when the consequences from heat aren't going to be deadly. Depending upon your risk tolerance, you could do an incredible amount of damage on an unsuspecting target. Or, even more interestingly, a target that sees you coming the whole time, but can't stop the inevitable. Now we are going to tackle a mech frog variant, just for fun and to revel in the narcissism for a few minutes. Based upon the 2N Eris, we're going to do an updated 3152 variant, using some of the gear pillaged from Wolf Empire held planets in the former Free Worlds League. The biggest changes to the structure are the use of Clan Endo Steel and the swap from an Inner Sphere XL engine to a light engine in order to cut the number of engine criticals from the side torsos from 3 to 2. We're going to keep the partial wing, but added just two double heat sinks to bring the total to 12. We've also added a half ton of armor to bring the total to 10.5 tons. The philosophy behind this variant was to create a long-range heavy hitter that could leap over buildings or up onto ridges, take its shot, and then retreat before it can suffer the consequences. In the right arm, there's a salvaged clan ERPPC which is going to be doing the bulk of the mech's damage. If things do get wild and wooly up close, a trio of small X pulse lasers in the left arm can reach out to 5 hexes for 3 damage apiece. An ER small laser in the head is a nice little insurance policy, and finally in the left torso there's an SRM-4 
along with one ton of ammunition. For the record sheet, included in the video comments below, I've added inferno rounds, but you of course could flavor your ammunition to taste. When firing at a distance, the mech is going to be quite chill thanks to the 12 double heatsinks and the partial wing. You can jump the full 7 hexes, fire your ERPPC, and still be at zero heat at the end of the turn. If you do have a close range visitor, the heat can be an issue. A full alpha strike would leave the Aeris MF at plus 5 heat, though you could actually get back to only plus 3 if you jump at least one hex during the movement phase to trigger the partial wings minus 3 heat benefit. While not offering anything special in the mid-range, the clan ERPPC allows the Aeris to be a pain in the butt no matter where you are on the battlefield. And it doesn't leave the mech too vulnerable should you need to close in on a target, which I think does a pretty good job of preserving the theme of the original Aeris. But I'm curious what you think. What's your favorite Aeris variant? I know there are quite a few people out there who purchased the premium plastic Aeris from CGL when it was available, and it's been a blast to see them take the mech to heart and share their fabulous paint jobs on Discord and Twitter. If your strong Purple Bird army is out there, how many heiresses are you running in it? Let me know in the comments, we'll keep the conversation going. Big thank you for hanging out today. If you felt it was worthwhile, please let YouTube know by hitting that like and subscribe button. Another free way to support the channel is to share this video with one other person who might enjoy it. If you do want to take the extra step to become a YouTube channel member, that goes a long way as ad revenue is likely much less than you might imagine. Every little bit helps keep the nonsense flowing. It's been a pleasure to cover the heiress, and until we meet again, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.